Tonight I want to talk a little bit about the state of our nation and how we can play a role in it. You know, everybody gives disclaimers these days. I'm on this board or associated with this group and therefore you have to take everything I say with a grain of salt. Well, I have a disclaimer to make. I'm not politically correct. So <laughs> Doesn't mean, doesn't mean that I try to offend people, but it does mean that I don't twist myself into a pretzel trying not to offend people. Because, you know, I think freedom of speech is a very important thing. It was a vital part of the establishment of this country. And, uh, you know, we need to make sure that we don't relinquish it in any way. Have you ever thought about the fact that America is the only nation that has a dream? There's no French dream. There's no Portuguese dream. There's no Nigerian dream. There's no Canadian dream. Canada thought they had one, but they, they don't have one. <laughs> We're the only ones who have a dream. The place that people from all over the world want to come because of the opportunities that we have here. And there are those these days who are trying to denigrate our country and say that it's a horrible place, that it's a systemically racist place, that it's a place that isn't fair to certain types of people. Oh, they preach that from the mountaintops. But if it was such a terrible place, why would people be forming caravans trying to get in here? And when they got here, wouldn't they call their relatives and friends and say, don't come here, this is a horrible place? That's not what, what's happening. What is happening is we have a lot of people in leadership positions who say, never mind what your eyes tell you, never mind what your ears tell you, never mind what your heart tells you, just listen to us. We'll tell you what is actually going on, and you'll be at peace. You don't have to worry about anything. And if there's something bad going on, like at our southern border, you just say, there's no problem at the border. It's fine. It's completely secure. Don't mind the fact that there are thousands of people coming across unregistered every day. That's nothing. And the economy, the economy is great. It's flourishing. Things are wonderful. Don't worry about the fact that you can't afford to buy food and gas for your car. That's just a mirage. They actually tell people these things. And there are people who actually believe it. But I don't think most people believe it, quite frankly. But here's the interesting thing. When our country was formed, a lot of people didn't believe that it would last. The Europeans in particular said, you can't run a country on the will of the people. You have to have a monarch. You have to have a ruling body. These Americans are foolish to think that you can run the country on the will of the people. And when we were putting together the Constitution, our founders, it looked like maybe those people were right because they could not come to agreement. In that last Constitutional Convention in 1787, it looked like the whole thing was going to fall apart. And then the elder statesmen, Benjamin Franklin said, gentlemen, stop. Let's get down on our knees and let's seek wisdom from the Lord. And they prayed and they got up and they resolved their differences and created what I believe is the greatest governing document in the history of the world, the United States Constitution, inspired by God. And when Franklin came out of the Constitution Hall, a woman said, sir, what do we have here? A monarchy or a republic? 
And Franklin said, a republic, if we can keep it. If we can keep it. We've kept it for 246 years. It is right now in the most trouble we've ever been in. Civil wars, world wars, civil rights movement, doesn't matter. Nothing has threatened our republic the way it is threatened today. And you see how quickly we have reached this stage in our country, a stage where our law enforcement agencies have been co-opted to go after political enemies. That's the kind of thing that happens in banana republics going on in the United States of America as we speak. No one in this room can be absolutely safe. Bureaucrats can target you, say that you're a MAGA Republican or some other thing, and sick the IRS on you, and you have no recourse. These are serious, serious times. And it's really time for everybody to start thinking what they can do about it. Well, a good part of the problem exists because now, according to the latest polling, only two-thirds of Americans believe in God or have a relationship with God. That number used to be in the 90s. You have to wonder, what are the implications of losing that faith in God? Because that was the thing that really distinguished us from so many other places. Other places believed that their rights came from the government or from the king. And we believed that our rights came from our creator, AKA God, as stated specifically in the Declaration of Independence. We also had leaders who believed in God. John Adams, our second president, said that our Constitution was designed for a moral and religious people and is totally inadequate for the governance of any other. Well, it seems to me like any other is here right now. And it's something that we need to think about. But the American dream, I want to return to that theme. My American dream was to be a doctor. I loved medicine from the very beginning, from the time I was a little kid. Anything on the radio about medicine, I was right there like a magnet. Anything on television, Ben Casey, Dr. Kildare, that stuff, man, I was all over it. I even liked going to the doctor's office. I mean, I would gladly accept a shot just so I could smell the alcohol swamps. But uh, I was totally into medicine. And I love the mission stories in church and Sabbath school that feature missionary doctors who travel all over the world at great expense and sacrifice to bring not only physical but mental and spiritual healing to people. And they seemed to me like the most noble people on the face of the earth. And I determined when I was eight years old that I would be a missionary doctor. And that was my goal until I was 13, at which time, having grown up in dire poverty, I decided I'd rather be rich. So at that point, missionary doctor was out and psychiatrist was in. Now, I didn't know any psychiatrists, but on TV, they seemed like rich people. They, you know, they lived in the fancy mansions, drove Jaguars, had these big plush offices. And all they had to do was talk to crazy people all day. <laughs> and it seemed like I was doing that anyway. So I said, I said, this is going to work out extremely well. And I started reading psychology today. My brother, my older brother, actually bought me a subscription to psychology today. 
for my birthday. And, uh, and that was a big sacrifice for him because he didn't have much money. But um, I started reading those things and started fancying myself as a little psychiatrist. Everybody would bring me their problems in high school. I would sit them down, stroke my chin, <laughs> say, tell me about your mama. And I majored in psychology at, at Yale, had incredible professors like Anna Freud, the daughter of Sigmund Freud. And I was really into psychoanalysis. I thought I was going to be the world's greatest psychiatrist. But then I got to medical school, and I start meeting a bunch of psychiatrists. <laughs> Need I say more? <laughs> Actually, some of my best friends are psychiatrists. But, you know, I really was so impressed by the lectures from the neurosurgeons and the incredible things that they could do with the brain and the spinal cord. I was just completely taken by it. And I started moving in that direction and people were saying, no, 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 that's the wrong specialty for you. At that time, there had been eight black neurosurgeons in the world. But I'll tell you a secret. God does not dispense talent based on race. It is not an issue with him. And I took to that neurosurgery like a duck takes to water. Started out as an adult neurosurgeon. A lot of people don't know that. But I quickly discovered that no, no matter how good an operation you did on those chronic back pain patients, they never got any better until they got their settlement. Whereas with kids, <laughs> what you see is what you get. You know, if they feel good, you know they feel good. If they feel bad, you know they feel bad. And you can operate on a kid for 10, 15, 20, 30 hours. And if you're successful, your reward may be 20, 50, 60, 80 years of life. Whereas with an old geezer, you know, you spend all that time operating and they die of something else in five years. So... I'd like to get a big return on my investment. <laughs> I'm just kidding, I like old people. I'm one of them now. <laughs> but, you know, you wouldn't have thought that there was much of a chance that I was going to realize my American dream because I was not a very good student. And I didn't think that I was smart. None of my classmates thought I was smart. None of my teachers thought I was smart. The only one who thought I was smart was my mother. And she was always saying, Benjamin, you're much too smart to be bringing home grades like this. I brought them home anyway, but she was always <laughs> saying something positive. And uh, I must admit that I did kind of admire the smart kids. I just wondered, how could they know so much? I remember there was this one kid named Steve. He was the smartest kid in the class. And he wanted to make sure you knew that. He would always, after a test, come up to you and hold his A in your face and say, here's what I got. Let me see yours. Let me see what you... You wanted to let him see it all right, you know. But <laughs> you'd get in trouble. But, uh, you know, my mother had a tremendous amount of faith in God. She didn't have much in the way of education, less than a third grade education, came from a large rural family, dire poverty, bounced around from place to place, got married at age 13, trying to escape that environment. She and my father moved to Detroit. Where he was a factory worker and a preacher. And um, she discovered that he was a bigamist, had another family. I remember I told that story at a graduation at the University of Utah. Nobody thought it was that strange. <laughs> now, of course, they don't do that anymore. You know that, right? 
That was in the old days. But uh, obviously that resulted in a divorce. And uh, for a while we didn't have any place to live and then some relatives in Boston took us in. Typical tenement, large multifamily dwelling, boarded up windows and doors, sirens and gangs. Rats, the water rats. I don't know if you've ever seen a water rat. I mean, the first time I saw one, I thought it was a dog. It was so big. And then the roaches. I mean, you would go into a room, and it was dark. and flip the light on it. It looked like the wall was moving. There would be so many roaches scurrying around. And violence, gangs. Both of my older cousins, who we adored, were killed. And I remember as a nine-year-old sitting on the ghetto stairs, looking through the building across the street out of which all the windows had been broken because there was a sunbeam shining through it. And it made me think about my future. And I remember thinking that I would probably never make it to 20 years of age, maybe 25 if I was lucky, because that's what I saw around me. But my mother was out working very hard, leaving at five in the morning, getting back after midnight, house to house to house as domestic cleaning. But she was really a spy because she wanted to know why these people were so successful. Why did they live in these beautiful homes? She studied them. And she concluded that it was because they didn't watch a lot of TV and they read a lot of books. So she came home one day and imposed that on me and my brother. And we were not happy campers. I mean, in today's world, we would have called social services. <laughs> they would have taken her away in handcuffs. But we, you know, we had to read the books. And uh, I didn't like it at first. But as I read about scientists and surgeons and explorers and entrepreneurs and inventors, I began to realize that the person who has the most to do with what happens to you in life is you. It's not somebody else. I stopped listening to all the people who were saying, society is stacked against you, you can't succeed. I just said, forget about you guys. I don't want to hear it. And I just started thinking about what I could do and reading constantly. If I had five minutes, I had a book I was reading. And within the space of a year and a half, I went from the bottom of the class to the top of the class. And I remember going up to Steve after a test. And uh, I said, Steve, how'd you do on the test? He poked out his chest. He said, oh, I got a 91. I said, well, gee, that's too bad. Oh, I got a 100. <laughs> and I said, if you need help next time, let me know. <laughs> I was perhaps a little obnoxious. But, you know, I had really a complete revolution, a complete change in the way that I thought. And what a difference that made. And yet I look at the children today, and I look at what they're subjected to, and you wonder, what's going to become of them? You know, for the longest time, they had to wear masks. They couldn't see people's facial expressions and correlate those with what they were saying. That's a very important part of sociological development. And then, they're told they may be harboring some horrible disease. It may not affect them, but they could pass it to their grandmother and kill their grandmother. Well, unfortunately, grandmothers do get older and they do die. Now you've got some kid feeling guilty about it. And then if they're white kids, you're oppressors and your people are oppressors. And they have created problems for everybody else and you should feel terrible about that. And if they're a black kid or a minority, you're a victim. And the system is stacked against you. Now, all of this is happening at the same time that kids are trying to develop their self-image. Think about that. 
And if that's not bad enough, you might not be a girl or a boy. You might be something else. Now, I think it's child abuse that what we're actually doing to the children. And how can we sit by and accept that? And we have to be willing to fight for the children. We have to be willing to run for a school board. We have to go to the school board meetings. We have to make sure of what they're teaching our children. Now take our human brain, most fascinating organ system in the entire universe, and put an animal brain next to it. Let's say a dog. Surface topography is really quite similar. Frontal lobes, parietal lobes, temporal lobes, occipital lobes, cerebellum, brainstem, midbrain. But the dog's midbrain is much better developed than the human midbrain. Well, what do you do with the midbrain? React. And that's why animals react so much faster than people. They cat like reflexes. Just like that, they react to what they see or what they hear or what they smell. People, on the other hand, have these very developed frontal lobes. What do you do with those? Engage in rational thought processing. Extracting information from the past, integrating with information from the present, projecting it into the future, planning and strategizing a year ahead, five years, 10 years, 20 years, engaging in analytical thought. And that's why people can judge people not on the basis of the color of their skin like an animal, but on the content of their character because of that analytical ability. And that's what Dr. Martin Luther King was talking about. And yet, they are teaching our children to act like animals and telling them that the color of someone's skin is the most important determinant of what happens to them. Think about how silly that is. You know, as a neurosurgeon, I operated on people from every part of the world. I'll tell you, when I took that skull flap off, I can't tell where they came from. And what makes you who you are? The color of your skin, the texture of your hair, the shape of your nose, or your brain? And we have to be smart enough to get beyond all this superficial stuff and recognize that God was merciful to give us variety. I mean, who would want to go to the National Zoo if every animal was a Thompson's gazelle? It really wouldn't be very interesting. Who would go to the National Aquarium if every animal was a goldfish? Who would want a bouquet if every flower was identical? Who would want to get up in the morning if everybody looked exactly like you? I mean, in some cases, it would be a national disaster. <laughs> and we should be happy that God was merciful and gave us variety. And why do we allow people to take things that are not a problem and turn them into a problem? And that's what's going on in the United States of America right now. Our creation of all kind of problems. You know, you look at the number one problem that people are talking about right now, inflation. Now, there are some economists who say there's a natural cycle of inflation. And the economy goes through these cyclical changes, ups and downs. Well, I will agree with them that there are ups and downs, but it's not a natural phenomenon. It's because we have times when we have leaders who understand the economy and do things accordingly, and we have people who have no clue what they're doing. And that's what's going on right now. You know, you think about the fact that we had become energy independent. Cleanest air and cleanest water since we've been measuring those things. The ability to extract the things safely. 
a net exporter of energy. And what did we do? We have a leader that comes in and says, because that guy who was before me did that, I'm stopping all of this stuff. And then all of a sudden, the energy prices start escalating dramatically. And we're asking other people to produce energy. And we're taking our national reserves of energy and squandering them to artificially lower prices. I mean, just stupid, self-inflicted injuries. It has nothing to do with Republicans or Democrats. It has to do with stupidity and immaturity. And we have to stop that, no matter who is in office, because we have to start doing things that work for the people, not for the Democrats, not for the Republicans, but for the people. We have to have the kind of leadership that will do that. And we're playing right into the hands, and some of it may actually be caused by those who want to see the demise of this country. Sixty years ago, some of you may remember, Nikita Khrushchev said to Dwight David Eisenhower, your grandchildren's children will live under communism and we will never have to fire one shot. Now, what did he know? He knew that all you had to do is gain control of the educational system so you could indoctrinate the young people, gain control of the media so you could spoon feed the people only what you wanted them to know, shield them from what you didn't want them to know, replace faith in God with faith in government, and raise the national debt to such astronomical levels that you could justify massive taxation, redistribution of wealth, and complete dependence on the government. Does any of that sound like stuff that's going on right now? It's all the things that are happening right before our very eyes, and it's working like a charm. And, and we are heading off the cliff. But it can be stopped. Won't be stopped by government, though. It will only be stopped by the people. Because the government is the government. Governments do what governments do. It doesn't matter if they're being run by Republicans or Democrats. Governments naturally grow, infiltrate, and dominate. Doesn't make them evil, makes them governments. No more than a lion is evil because it kills gazelles and eats them. That's what lions do. Doesn't make them evil, it makes them a lion. Our founders understood that. They studied every government that had ever existed. And they created a constitution specifically to restrain the government, to keep the government from dominating the people. That's why we have all of these rights for the people. Things like the Second Amendment. People say, well, you don't need a high-powered weapon to go deer hunting or to go duck hunting. Guess what? The Second Amendment is not about deer hunting or duck hunting. It's about the people having the ability to defend themselves from an overly aggressive government. And some people don't actually understand that, and that's why they say things like that. All of our rights were examined very carefully, and there was a, a reason that things were written the, the way that they were. But, <clears throat> but it's important that we understand that. It's important that we understand the Constitution. If you go to the website, American Cornerstone, Dot org, which is my new organization. You can read the Constitution there, and you can get some commentary, see some questions and answers. You can read the Declaration of Independence. You can see interviews with all kinds of people about important topics, about what's going on in our country today. Uh, I would encourage you to listen to our podcast, it's called Common Sense with Dr. Ben Carson. 
because common sense really is not common anymore, particularly in Washington, D.C. And we have to equip ourselves with what we need to be able to overcome the forces that are trying to fundamentally change this country. And you can read about the Little Patriots. As Robin was showing you the, the book there, that's one of our books, it's called Red, White, and Blue, Our Flag Matters to Me and You. And it starts out with a little boy finding a torn and tattered American flag on the ground. And then Liberty Eagle, who is the moderator for all the books and all the online learning programs, comes along and explains to him what the stars mean, what the stripes mean, about the people who've sacrificed so that we could have freedoms. And by the end of the book, the boy wants to pick that flag up, dust it off, and honor it. We don't denigrate people who want to kneel and who want to denigrate the flag. We never do that. But we help people to understand the good of this country. And in an online learning program, we cover the good, the bad, and the ugly. Because there was bad and ugly in our country. You know why? Because our, our country is inhabited by human beings. And human beings are imperfect, which is why we need a savior. But Liberty Eagle, who is the moderator of all the programs, is a bald eagle, has a right wing and a left wing. Can't fly with two right wings, can't fly with two left wings. When they work together, can soar majestically. This is the message that we have to begin to get across to our young people. We don't want them to go further down the road of hatred and division, which has been started already. We have to do everything we can turn that around because we, the American people, are not each other's enemies. It's the people who are trying to divide us who are the enemies. That is not our natural tendency to hate each other because we have different yard signs out. And that's another major issue that we push at the American Cornerstone. And I hope you'll go home and look particularly at the Little Patriots page, littlepatriotslearning.com, and look at some of the newer cartoons We've hired some of the very best animators in the business from Disney and Pixar and ABC Kids who are not woke people. And they've created things that no young person is gonna turn away from. They're extremely educational and fun to watch. And we have K through five different programs. And here's the best part, it's all free because the proceeds from the books go right back into the program to keep it free. And we have wonderful donors who make it possible to keep it free because we want to make sure that every American has access. And uh, as the Lord blesses and the program continues to grow, uh, we hope to really change, be a big part of helping to change America as each of you are doing. And we're delighted to be here uh, at this time with you all, knowing that you have a heart for God and for Jesus and for what that means. Because isn't that where we all have derived our success? You know, when I was a young attending neurosurgeon, I remember thinking that I was pretty hot stuff. I said, you know, came out of Detroit, went to Yale University, of Michigan, Johns Hopkins, became the chief of pediatric neurosurgery at the number one hospital at age 33. I said, you are a bad dude. <laughs> you know, but along came this little boy from Georgia. And at age two, he was already reciting Bible verses. He was a prodigy. But when he was four, he lost all of his abilities. He couldn't walk anymore double vision, trouble swallowing and handling secretions. He was diagnosed with malignant brainstem tumor. 
and they saw multiple specialists and they all said the same thing, inoperable, malignant brainstem tumor, take them home, keep them comfortable and let them die. And when that boy rolled onto the ward at Johns Hopkins, I remember seeing him. He was barely moving, barely breathing, foaming at the mouth, eyes looking in different directions. I said, what am I supposed to do with this? And I saw the CAT scan. And it was a big, ugly brainstem tumor. And the parents said, doctor, we were directed to come here by the Lord because we would find a Christian pediatric neurosurgeon and the Lord was going to use him to heal our son. And I said, but this is an inoperable brainstem tumor. There's nothing I or anyone can do about this. And they said, but doctor, the Lord. And I said, okay, I'll tell you what, you came all the way up here from Georgia. Um, let's do an MRI. MRIs were brand new at that time. I said, maybe it'll show us something the CAT scan doesn't show us. Did it, MRI, all the neuroradiologists looked at it, same diagnosis, malignant brainstem tumor, nothing to be done. I went and I told the family, and they said, but doctor, the Lord is going to heal our son. He's going to use you to do it. I said, look, once in a thousand cases, the scans are wrong, and sometimes you can have something like a big, reaction and it looks like a tumor from a fungus or something. I said, I'll do a biopsy. Took him to the operating room, went down to the brainstem area, big ugly grayish red tumor. I took a frozen section that came back high grade glioma, a very malignant tumor. And I took out as much as I dared, closed it up, went out and talked to the family, told them that uh, unfortunately it looked like it was what we thought. And I said, you know, the Lord only knows how long we're each supposed to be here. Maybe we've served our purposes already. We'll understand it better by and by. Fully expecting that he would die, as I walked away, they said, thank you, doctor, but the Lord is going to heal our son. And I said, I've never seen people with faith like this fully expecting that he would deteriorate and die, but over the next couple of days, his eyes became conjugate, looking in the same direction. He was handling his secretions. I said, what is going on? I said, let's get another MRI. Still a big, ugly tumor. But the, way up in the corner, there was a little ribbon of tissue. And I said, is it possible that this thing is outside of the brainstem and has just compressed and displaced and squashed the brainstem. And maybe we should go back in and the parents said, by all means. And when we went back in there, the nature of the tumor was different, it had changed. Under the microscope, we peeled it away layer by layer and we got to the last layer. There was a glistening white brainstem smashed and displaced but intact. Long story short, that boy walked out of the hospital and today is a minister. Yeah. One, of the, one of the oncologists said to me after that case, Ben, I've always been an atheist. I'm a believer now. But it really wasn't for him. It was for me. Because you see, I thought I was doing all these things. I thought I was this great neurosurgeon. And after that case, I realized that it was him. And I said, Lord, from now on, you be the neurosurgeon, I'll be the hands. And the hands were a gift, and that's why the name Gifted Hands. And at that point, all kinds of amazing, once in a lifetime cases started coming my way, and we were successful with them. And I never, at any point, believed that it was me. It's always God. And he has all of this under control. All of the things that are happening in our society right now that are so discouraging and make us think that we're going down the tubes, he knows what he's doing. I personally believe that it's taking this to wake us up. We were in the fog. 
slowly drifting like a frog in the saucepan with the heat being slowly turned up. And now it's like somebody slapped us in the face with a cold fish. I think we're waking up in a hurry. And I think that's exactly what's needed. But we all have to do our part. We have to be brave. We have to recognize that maybe there's some turmoil that may result in our lives. We have to be like the great Americans during World War II, when the young women went into the factories and built more airplanes, tanks, and mortars than anybody could imagine. And the young men, 16, 17, 18 years old, many of them lied about their age so they could fight for our country. Think about D-Day if they approached the shores of Normandy, getting out there and being mowed down by machine gun fire, a hundred dead bodies, a thousand dead bodies. Were the others afraid? Did they turn back? Yes, they were afraid, but they did not turn back. They stepped over the bodies and they overwhelmed the Axis forces knowing in many cases that they would never see their homeland again. They would never see their families again. But why did they do it? Not for themselves, but they did it for you and me so we could live in peace and freedom. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is our turn to do it for those who are coming after us. Thank you. <laughs>